My name is Barbara Kohn. I'm the director of the Austrian Economic Center and the Hayek Institute Austria Vienna. And uh, I have with me my colleague Pietro Paganini from Rome, who is our co-host of the European Resource Bank meeting in Rome. This year, a little bit more virtual, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we have, that's the second year that we do uh, this uh, meeting uh, digital, but next year, finally, and this is a promise by Pietro and me, uh, we, will, we will go and do it live. Uh, to be honest, I was just in Italy last Monday. It was a, it was wonderful to be in the country again, and I can't and I think we all can't wait to be there and um, meet and greet each other and work together for the next challenges that all the European think tanks face. And after all, the European Resource Bank meeting is not only about celebrating and meeting and exchanging things, but also about uh, discussing what, what we will do together, what we will collaborate on in the next couple of years and months to come. And uh, of course, uh, this year, the COVID crisis and the so-called um, health crisis and the consequences thereof of the lockdowns have keep have kept us all busy but we all hope that ease uh, that an ease will come to everyone and um, I would simply invite you for next year to join us live in Rome and before we go to our keynote speaker Jaron Brooks I will uh, uh, hand over the floor to Pietro who will uh, introduce uh, everybody as the host of today's event. Thank you so much, Barbara. And let me, let me greet you. And I didn't know you were in Italy. That's a bad thing you have informed me, but it depends on which part of Italy you were because you still consider some of it part of Austria, but uh, I, <laughs> I left that to you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for, for being here, for joining us. Barbara, let's not forget that we have people here on Zoom, but most of people are following us on, on YouTube or following us on, on Facebook. And uh, this is a recorded event, so we'll be available. And it, today is very important because we are going to give out some prizes. And of course, you will be the one cheering the three winners. And actually, there is one that gets on top, but there, are, there were great presentations that we enjoyed a few weeks ago and people voted for them. And after our keynote speech, I will be happy to enjoy and give the opportunity to three speakers that we have here that I will introduce later on. So people stay here with us and we will talk about the, you know, post pandemic and what has happened during the pandemic and what will be the next uh, few months or years ahead of us, considering the big spending of governments, the big new rules that we have and how Europe and the world will be shaped in uh, the next uh, future. But stay here, because if you move away after the keynote, you will miss the three great speakers that are here uh, with us. So stay here and uh, enjoy the keynote and back to Barbara. And um, well, I'm here with you guys. So let's enjoy it for the next hour and out. Thank you. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Jaron Brooks, who you all know, who has also been one of the judges of Dragon's Den. Uh, he was pretty tough to be honest. Uh, Yaron is not only internationally known for all his publications and books that he uh, that he was working on but you know for and for having been the chair of Ayn Rand Institute and now being on the board and uh, defending uh, pro-market libertarian ideas in the sense of uh, our of the great wo woman called Ayn Rand and the lady who is a big example shining example to many of us libertarian who uh, libertarians who has actually brought many to our thinking because those people who have read Atlas Shrugged, for example, all of a sudden became interested in what uh, what can be done if you put the right, if you ask the right questions and if you challenge certain other individuals. Uh, without further ado, I would just simply uh, give the floor to Yaron and we're all looking forward to your keynote. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you for inviting me uh, to, to speak today. Uh, it, it, we're living through, obviously, difficult times. The fact that we're doing this on Zoom and not all together uh, live is, is a, I guess, to some extent, a sad testament to the times in which we live. This has been going on now for over a year. There's no end, really, in sight. Maybe there is. I don't know. I still can't come to Europe. 
I'm waiting for the day when when they announce that uh, I can come to Europe. I'm vaccinated, so, but uh, they still won't let me in. What we've seen over the last year with COVID is I think the largest expansion of government power, government control that we have ever seen in peacetime. This is equivalent, uh, COVID has been equivalent in terms of growth of government, the government takeover of economies across the world, the government restrictions on our civil liberties, on our freedom, on our individual rights, that is just unprecedented. And it's unprecedented even when taking into account the context of a pandemic. No, uh, no agency that was responsible for planning for a pandemic, uh, the CDC, the European institutions, ever planned to lock entire populations down, to shut down everything, to shut down life, not for a day or for weeks, but for months and now over a year. And yet, it's what happened. Our politicians panicked. They viewed this as a massive opportunity for a massive power grab, and they took it. And what is truly stunning, amazing, and scary is that they faced almost no resistance. No resistance from the people, very little resistance from intellectuals. Those of us on the free market side might have objected, but we were drowned out. We were drowned out by the statists who really dominate today every aspect of life, certainly in America and in Europe. We are all China now. It used to be that the model to emulate was the United States in a sense, the liberty, the freedom, the, the, the semi-capitalism, but that's not the case today anymore. Today, the model is China. We emulated them in terms of the response to the virus. The solution to a virus is to lock everybody down. Now, we can't quite get away with doing it as efficiently and as ruthlessly as the Chinese do. So we do a China light. Um, we don't trust markets to distribute vaccines, to distribute PPE, to distribute medical uh, supplies to distribute medical services. So again, we rely on a China light model where we take control of the economy, where we regulate and control everything and we rely on government for everything. And again, the people just went along. In the United States, we have now printed uh, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars under the guise of some Keynesian stimulus uh, as if Keynes was still a thing. I thought those rap videos clearly showed that he lost and uh, that we shouldn't be taking him seriously, but I guess uh, it didn't matter. Um, he is still the darling of the statists. And of course, there are many who would like to capitalize on this to make it permanent and to increase the power of government in a permanent manner. And you're seeing that coming out of the World Economic Forum the whole idea of a great reset is the great reset to statism, to more statism, to greater government involvement. It is a great reset. Hey, if we can shut the economy down around COVID, why not shut the economy around climate change? It's just as bad. It's going to kill everybody at the end. So we better do something. Let's get the government even more involved in people's lives, more in control of what we do and how we do it. The last year, at least for me, has been the most depressing in terms of when it comes to politics and the state of the world uh, in my lifetime. It has shown not only the willingness of our politicians to engage in massive state control and massive state takeover, but again, the lack of opposition, the lack of opposition throughout. Now, this all in spite of the fact that there were some real positives that were illustrated through COVID. The role of technology in our lives, the, the, the massive achievement of technology companies, not that anybody is thanking them, we actually want to break them up and, and sue them and, and control them and regulate them uh, as a consequence of their great achievements. But, but the fact is that life was bearable in spite of the lockdowns, in spite of everything else, uh, not because of our grand politicians and our political leaders, but because of Zoom, because of Amazon because of uh, big tech, because of Apple, 
because of the great innovations, the amazing progress that uh, tech has made over the last 20 years to connect us all and to make it easy for us to communicate even when we can't go outside or even when we can't fly around the world. So it is something to celebrate and look at in terms of what made that possible? What made it possible for technology to advance so fast and so successfully and highlight that to the world? I mean, my view is, and I know this is controversial, is that those of us who believe in free markets should be cheerleaders for technology companies. This is the one area in, the, in, in, in our economy that is the least regulated and therefore the most successful and therefore an example of what could happen in the world if we don't regulate, if we don't control, if we don't centrally plan. And we should use that uh, in spite of the fact that big tech is so often so leftist. The second, of course, great thing is also related to this and that is the vaccines. I mean, the vaccines are truly an amazing achievement, a stunning achievement. And again, an example of what happens when the state just backs off just a little bit, just a little less regulations, a little less controls, speed things up. Now, in my view, we could have had the vaccines in the summer. We could have had them in June if they'd allowed for people to voluntarily agree to take the vaccines early once they were proved to be safe. Uh, we could have been vaccinated uh, months ago. But that is, of course, the failure of the state to distribute, the failure of the state to, quote, approve. But in terms of what industry has done, and again, what is our response? Let's take away their patents. Again, I know controversial. And let's, and let's uh, break up big uh, pharma and let's go all out attack our pharmaceutical industries because they're so evil. Um, and yet they're the ones who are saving us, uh, uh, saving us right now. And finally, education, where I think uh, because kids were stuck at home and, and going to school, maybe some parents realized the, um, the pathetic uh, educational quality that these kids, that the kids are receiving. I think there's a lot of innovation in education. There's a lot of disruption coming down the pipe with uh, technology and education. We all should be at the forefront of that, defending people's right to choose the kind of education that kids get and emphasizing and trying to work for ultimately privatizing education getting the state out of education is probably the most crucial thing we could be working on, which would have the biggest benefits and the biggest dividends in the long run if we could privatize the educational system. I know that's ambitious, but that's what we're here for. So quickly, what is our path forward? Well, we've got to fight because I think things are going to get worse for us, not better. Um, uh, the, the, the status, they emboldened, um, and uh, and uh, they are going to propose new things that are going to infringe on our freedoms and liberties. We have to be able to propose alternatives. We have to show the world that what was what allowed civilization to continue during the pandemic was a consequence of private markets, and what hampered our ability to live was a consequence of government. You can see that in the complete failing of testing and vaccine distribution. And, and shortages of all kinds of products versus those areas that are relatively free like tech and vaccine development. We need, we need market solutions to all these problems. We need a free market alternative to response to pandemics rather than relying 100% on government. We need uh, uh, ideas and we need to ramp up the passion, the intensity, and the hard work that I know all of us are engaged in, in order to fight off what I think is gonna be a major assault on our values. In the end, I think the good ideas win out, but the end is a long, can be a long time. Um, and uh, we have the right ideas. We need to engage with those ideas. We need to engage with the world. We need to intensify our efforts uh, and, uh, and commit to doing that in the months and the years to come. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Yaron. I think this was a lot of food for thought. Um, the applause is here. Um, we, we see it from in the faces. Uh, and uh, I think uh, these problems that you mentioned uh, will be part of, uh, of what we will discuss uh, in the couple of next months. 
and also what our winners uh, of the probably next year's European Resource Bank meetings, Dragon's Den, will present solutions to. And without further ado, I would like to ask Victoria um, that uh, she uh, basically presents the checks as soon as I've uh, invited our um, rep uh, respective winners uh, to the floor. Unfortunately, we cannot do this live. Usually we toast a lot during these uh, final events. This always takes place on a Friday at the European Resource Bank meeting, uh, not on a Saturday because we want to, uh, because we still need to work a little bit, but this, sorry, it takes place on a Saturday because we need to work uh, on Saturday and Friday during the day. But uh, today it's Thursday. Nonetheless, we will toast uh, to everybody then. Um, but let me just give you a little bit of background. First of all, um, we want to thank our sponsors and partners, for those sponsors who have made it possible to uh, let uh, the to, to allow us to, to uh, make this event and the Dragon's Den especially possible. And the big thanks go to uh, Global Philanthropic Trust who always provide the price money, but there's also many other sponsors and partners who you can see on our website and on the webpage who uh, support not only the European Resource Bank meeting, but generally also support European think tanks and their work. Uh, but uh, let me give you a little bit of background. We had uh, tons of uh, people who sent uh, actually tons of uh, papers and presentations that were sent in, handed in. Uh, our jury uh, uh, picked a couple out of them, eight, were in the finals and out of these finals we have um, three winners and let me tell you those projects that were handed in and were discussed during the meeting most of you were present at the discussion and you also saw, saw the online voting those meetings uh, those uh, those presentations were great uh, each and everybody had to com contribute a large deal to um, what the needs of the movement are and was looking into possible solutions. Uh, whether it was the case for women's um, rights uh, and, and the libertarian movement, whether it was a special tutoring and exchange program in Arizona, or whether it was uh, something about um, uh, networking in general or in or about the Austrian, uh, Austrian school, uh, something very scientific. But I do not want to keep you uh, much longer and don't want to make it too tough for our three winners. Um, and let me start uh, with number three. And number three is a project by a lady uh, in Southeast Europe. She has done a lot of work, uh, is very successful in her country, very prominent already. And I would like to ask uh, Mirella uh, to the floor. Mirella, please join us. You won the third prize with your project uh, with the APRO Association, Egoist uh, Publishing House. And uh, please join us, warm, Welcome and please present, tell us a little bit of what about your program, what is it about? And then you will be handed over the check. Thank you very much, Barbara. And thank you very much for uh, voting our uh, project. Uh, as uh, Yaron said, uh, from our side also education, uh, it's a big issue, not only for Romania or Southeast countries, but for uh, the entire globe. Um, as an entrepreneur, I came uh, around and I saw that uh, we need people to work, to make teams, to create ideas, and we need people to think. So that's why the program uh, is called uh, in Romanian language, uh, Desk, but in the international language, I think, because, because we want to encourage or um, uh, re-educate uh, the teenagers uh, in a manner of uh, thinking with their own mind and not with, our, the, with other minds and to ask all the time the question, why? Why is this? 
why, who is the benefit for this, why is this important and what is in for me. So we hope that the project uh, will gonna be at least a success in Romania. We started the project already. We are in a pilot uh, stage and um, we hope that uh, it's gonna be bigger next year. <laughs> Thank you very much for voting me. Well, congratulations uh, uh, to you, Marina, and to all your work. Uh, the check will be handed over now by Victoria, uh, at least virtually. We will send it to you and we make sure that here, here we go. Um, congrats. Uh, and let me also, using this opportunity to thank our jury. And the jury uh, consisted of Susanne Eidstedt, who is uh, present also today. Michael Yeager, who is also listening today in this part of, it, of our event today. Uh, Marco Weber, um, Krasen Stanchev, and Yaron Brook. And uh, those four were the ones who made up the vote. Plus we had an online vote, um, which uh, turned out in a little, a little bit different than our judges did. And I will not tell you right now who won the online voting because it was uh, weighed in a different way. But um, I just give you a background on our judges. Well, Yaron Brook, you all know, you have heard him. Uh, you have met him at various occasions, not only at the Free Market Roadshow, but um, also uh, during our last European Resource Bank meeting event. Susan Eidstedt is well known to everybody. She and her husband have been working uh, in Sweden and changing uh, a lot of things there and are uh, uh, true fighters for freedom there. Susan, and Suzanne is an entrepreneur and she has been very helpful uh, in the past years, has been a, a dragon in the past as well. And um, thank you, Susanna, for being with us and for joining us. Uh, new to the team was Marco Weber. Marco is a Swiss entrepreneur and thinker and also engaged in politics. Marco has been um, is a libertarian and has been working with us uh, on the free market road in Switzerland and a couple of other events and knows many people in the libertarian movement. And as an entrepreneur, he was also part of, of the jury. Um, then we had Michael Yeager, who is a well-known uh, gentleman to all of you. Marco, Marco, uh, sorry, Michael is um, the head of the European, uh, of the, uh, actually the Secretary General of the European Economic Senate. He's, uh, he's working with the Taxpayers uh, uh, Association of Europe and also the B Bavarian Taxpayers Association where he is head of and also with a, with a, with, uh, and a journalist club in, in, in Europe. So he has a very extensive and broad network and knows a lot of people in the political movement, but also on the other side, on the ideas side, and was active as a, as a dragon as well. And lastly, Krasen Stanchev, who has been partnering with us from the very first beginning. He actually hosted the first European Resource Bank meeting uh, in Borovets, which was held in 2003, uh, in, um, which is close to Sofia. And back then, we were only a handful of uh, European think tanks uh, joining there and discussing what will what are our next challenges. And Crescent um, has been partner has been partnering with us and his think tank, the IMF, uh, for more than the twenty years knows the libertarian and pro-market network across Europe and the world and was also one of our judges. So without further ado, having introduced the judges now, I would like to ask uh, or introduce the second, number two, the second winner. Thank you, Mirella, for joining us. And I would now ask um, a gentleman from Montenegro who handed in the Global Communication Network uh, project Decent decentralized Future Project, Ilya, the floor is yours. Please join us. Uh, thank you so much. This was a great opportunity for me and my organization. We put so much work in this project and this presentation, and it was a great surprise for all of us. I was all over the national TVs and me medias and also uh, I was shared by so many individuals that 
supported this idea of decentralization. And I want to thank uh, you, judges. I want to thank your sponsors. I want to thank uh, participants for giving us this great opportunity to pursue our mission to make this place uh, better. Thank you so much. This was a great honor for us and great opportunity. Thank you, Ilya. And I think this is most important what you all, what you mentioned right now, because being in the media is something that is very important to our think tanks and those who have not won today, unfortunately, because I wish we could have handed out much more money and handed out more prices to all of you. Um, those who have not won, uh, never give up, don't give in try again next year, um, hand in other projects or work with the same and please do contact us. There is wonderful feedback from all, the, from all of the judges that we would like to uh, provide you in person or personally. Unfortunately, not over a glass of wine right now or you wait for another couple of months until we can do that. But uh, Ilya, this is your check, uh, 3000 euros from the Global Philanthropic Trust. Uh, it will be wired to you and uh, we will toast to you very soon. Now, thank you again and big applause to you. Thank you. I wanna now, just uh, thank uh, my university of Tonya Gorica who supported this idea also in, they are in uh, Podgorica in the main town. So I wanna thank them also, thank you. That is wonderful. We all need to stick to our uh, to our network and we all need to cooperate. And after all, libertarians believe in the division of labor. So we should, we should do that and be the shining examples of doing that and cooperate and collaborate wherever we can. Now I would like to thank those wonderful five individuals who unfortunately did not win the first prize now or did not win any of the prizes this year, but uh, who have presented uh, great work and who will definitely be on our radar in the future. Because after all, the European Resource Bank meeting is about European think tanks, but uh, you will see that we go global. And uh, I just would like, I would start with the ladies. I would uh, thank Paola for handing in her uh, contribution. I would like to thank Sharanti for handing in her contribution on the Arizona project. I would like to thank Amat, um, Sharanti and Jose. You all did a wonderful job in presenting uh, your work. Uh, the jury really did have a hard time and maybe Susanna would like to say a couple of words before we finally announce the winner. Uh, Susanna, would you come in please? Thank you, Barbara. Well, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you on behalf of the jury. Thank you to you all. Thank you for your efforts and your pictures. It was delight to see all the hard work you've been put down on it and you are all winners in our eyes because of what you presented because of your fight for a free market and for freedom i wish and um, the whole jury wish that we could give each and all of you a prize and we are going to keep our fingers crossed for a successful future in the fight thank you so much Thank you very much, Susanne. And please be encouraged by Susanne's word, words. Don't give up and uh, keep on the hard work that you all do with all your think tanks, with all your groups, because it's, it's, it is important to, uh, to fight for freedom and uh, for this most important good that we have to defend in our lives. And now, no, usually we have drums coming up. Uh, we can't do that here now. Um, but now the last person who was in the final, who I, whose name I have not mentioned is uh, Francisco Zales Martinez. He's from uh, Instituto Equatoriano de Economica Politica. And he has uh, handed in a project called Ideas Lab 2021 
Francisco, I haven't seen your face, but I saw your name. I hope the network is, the, uh, the Wi-Fi is working. The floor is yours. Will you briefly present? Francisco? Uh, yes, thank you. I have a small problem with my camera. It happened to become damaged. Actually, I can turn it on, but sadly, you won't be able to see me. Not much, uh, <laughs> not much of you. <laughs> yeah, there's actually just a little corner right here in which you yeah. can see me. Uh, well, I want to thank you all. Uh, it was really incredible to be able to be part of the eight finalists that presented their projects. Uh, thank you for your mention. I was actually, you know, pretty giddy with excitement right now because I realized there were two names you hadn't mentioned yet and I was one of the last, but I'm glad, you know, uh, we were able to present. I'm very happy that you all got a good impression of the project and what we talked about. And uh, yeah, Ideas Lab is a project to uh, further expand uh, liberalist uh, ideas around Ecuador and Latin America with online training programs that take place on two different weekends, uh, about 12 hours of programs. They have replica workshops and it's going. <laughs> I'm really excited. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So the check, please, uh, Victoria, we can see that again now. <laughs> Victoria, yes, one second. So Francisco, this is your check for, your, for the work you will do and you do. And please be reminded that we of course need reports from you. Reports on the progress because everything is measured. As we all know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And here in the, here in the movement, um, we have, um, how do you say, we're not only looking at, uh, at the measurements, but we also look at, at uh, opportunities. And one of the opportunities I would like to also bring across is Ignacy's, um, uh, Ignacy's uh, project that uh, unfortunately he did not win this time. Uh, but Ignacy is a dear friend of ours in, uh, in uh, Spain, who has, who I think most of the libertarians, at least those who work in the Spanish speaking world know. And Ignacy has handed in a, a, a project to support females in, in the libertarian movement. So maybe Ignacy, unfortunately it didn't work out this year, but uh, maybe you could push the network a little bit further and everybody uh, will help and support to get more women and females or ladies visible in, in the movement. We had three very prominent, charming ladies presenting their projects, um, but we can always use more. We can always have more ladies to be heard, uh, but I would like to congratul uh, congratulate again the winners. Um, Mirella, uh, Ilya, and Francisco, congratulations. I think we will take the pictures next year live, but I would like to toast you this time with apple juice. Next time uh, we drink live good Italian wine in Rome when Pietro is hosting our European Resource Bank event. And we will definitely have a, yes, toasts to everybody. Cheers. We will definitely party, we'll definitely learn from each other. And um, again, looking forward to having you back, to discussing with everybody of you and um, stay tuned. I would, like, I would now like to hand over to Pietro Paganini, my dear colleague from Rome, our host of the European Resource Bank meeting. And Pietro uh, will definitely um, introduce our speakers and our discussions after uh, Yaron has brought so many uh, questions or issues on the floor. Uh, looking forward to hearing your remarks. Pietro, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara, so much for introducing myself, but also for hosting this beautiful event. And congratulations to all the winners and also who didn't win as 
as I just heard from Suzanne, everybody is a winner whenever we take opportunities to make, you know, a, a little different or a little change. Is what I tell my students all the time. It's not about making money. Yeah, it's also about making money. It's not about being on the New York Times front page. It's about what we can do for, for ourselves and for people uh, around us. I was asked to run the end of this incredible day by introducing three speakers that will somehow follow up to what uh, Pieron has just uh, introduced or just said a few minutes ago, uh, talking about the pandemic. But here, the, the, the title for today is the world after COVID-19. And you, let's say we were supposed to be in Rome last year with you, Barbara, and with you folks. We couldn't. We are not here now. We are online. Hopefully next year, again, we will be here. That means the virus will be endemic or the virus will be gone, uh, whatever uh, of the two. But for sure, we can really talk about the virus, uh, the, 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 the word after the pandemic or after COVID-19. For the moment, COVID-19 is still here with us. So let's say the virus is still here with us, but how will the world look like in the next few days, months, weeks, and I would say even hours or minutes. I want to discuss this and uh, uh, with three distinguished and incredible speakers. I will start with Suzanne Ilstedt, that is uh, from Scantec Strategy Advisor in Sweden. And if you... ...our speakers, I'm gonna go to them, but uh, 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 just visit our site. So you also, you know, give the chance to yourself uh, to, to view the website. There's also with us John Karlambakis, uh, originally Greek, now living in the United States from Black Summit Financial Group. And then we have instead from Europe, uh, Nikola Lilic from the University of Belgrade uh, Faculty of Law. I want to start with Susan, asking for some comments about what Yaron said. And Susan is up in Sweden. And, you know, Sweden has been a sort of very different country for all the other countries in Europe for the policy that were established. But at a certain point, Sweden has decided to, do, to go into a lockdown. Can you tell us more about what has happened in Sweden and what will be instead, according to you, the future for Europe and for the world after this COVID-19 crisis, after the incredible spending that major economies are doing? Think about Europe and their recovery plan or fund. Think about the trillions that uh, President Biden is investing in the United States. And what will be the consequence for, for young generation? There's a limitation of freedom and liberties and is also bigger depth for the future because at the end, all this money for us and for our kids is a big depth. Suzanne. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me to this great event. It's always one of the best days every year when we go to the European Resource Bank. But uh, so it's nice to be here too, but it's not as nice, of course, that to meet you live, but still it's like it is. Uh, a few words about Sweden. Um, we've noticed that so many says, oh, you're finally one of the freedom good examples in a way. And I'm not so sure that we Swedes actually agree on that. Uh, this pandemic has been, um, a showcase of quite weak leadership, honestly, in Sweden. So um, we will see. I don't. I don't know. I think yet. To be quite honest, I want to see the consequences first. We have a lot of deaths, very many deaths, and many difficulties with the healthcare and stuff. So um, we'll see what it is. But anyway, it's been kind of weak leadership. But what will happen next? I've been thinking about entrepreneurship a lot now, how that will change. I do like to start with tapping into Jaren's uh, great speech before. I think the stricter regulations might stay longer than needed, as he said. Uh, people will not notice as much and uh, they will even find it okay, which is sort of dangerous. It's not a good thing, of course, and it needs to be watched out for, like Jaron said. Also, the wanting for strong leaders in democratic countries as in not democratic countries. Uh, 
I think for a few years ahead, leading politicians can propose large, expensive and not very libertarian programs by referring to the effects of COVID-19. Uh, I think that might happen, and I think I see it already happen. So we have to stand our ground here. It's uh, also that. But business. In Sweden, during the pandemic year of uh, 2020, we had 14% more businesses started than during the year before. Extremely high number, 14% for Sweden. And this continues this year. And sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds really good. It's not. Um, quite a few of these businesses and companies were started by people that have lost their jobs during the corona year. And I'm afraid that a large part of these new businesses will not exist in a few years' time. And those who had started a company now uh, found it not their way. It could have been during other circumstances, but they will be put off business, to be quite honest. So lessons learned about this. Um, we did during this time need to learn how to lead remote work and how to do business without meeting people face to face. And if lessons were learned well, this could lead to more global business opportunities and a growth because of that. Because we have passed that barrier that we have to meet every time face to face we do business. However, we did at the same time, well, entrepreneurs did basically to survive, learn how to keep good long-term relationships with their business partners. Um, this will continue and they value being married, so to speak, to their business partners more. They settle down, they tone down their much needed pit bull selling mode, if I could call it that. Um, the isolation also made them question the hard work of an entrepreneur. So one big risk, as I see it, is an increased downscaling, especially if it's in a country with some high taxes, like Sweden. Is it worth all the hassle? Are we not quite happy with status quo? Do we really need to grow? Will the profit really go down a lot in the end? You know, those kind of questions we didn't raise before. This together with what Yaron said and what I just said, might very well affect risk taking and thereby innovations and growth. When one doesn't meet competitions face to face or even watch out for it, um, and perhaps you question the hunger for doing more business like all entrepreneurs have deep inside, uh, one gets lazy, no new ideas will come up. And I see this as one of the most worrying tendencies right now. What needs to be done, of course, is making it even more profitable to be an entrepreneur than it is today. Lower all kinds of taxes on ownership of businesses. Also, cutting red tape is extremely important to boost growth, basically. And a few thoughts about the rest of our lives. Um, I have a soft spot for sociology and uh, I've been thinking about how this affects the values in a way. What we see in our country, and I guess in most countries, and I've read a few studies about it, it's housing, family, time. We find those subjects more valuable and we value it even more, how the family is and sufficient material standards will be more important. Let's say rather a swimming pool in the suburban garden instead of a cool but small apartment on a great address in the city. That, that kind of, to be simplifying it a lot. And um, I think people has realized the importance of a happy family life more. So this is of course already happening. So overall, as I see, it's a greater appreciation for a slightly more, I don't know what to call it, perhaps a classic conservative values in all areas. And with that, the death of woke and identity politics was can't afford being worried about those kinds of things anymore. We, and the dark cloud is, as I, as I just said, uh, lesser risk taking and uh, thereby a risk for less innovation and growth. And uh, it's all the dark prediction, but that's my spontaneous thought about it. Thank you, Susan, or gratis, or congratulations for your, your talks as well. Uh, let me turn to John. I assume you are in the U.S. right now. And a few months ago, I think it was before Christmas, 
Uh, we had a chance in our Austrian Economics Monthly, and Barbara, I assume in June we will go back to our Austrian Economics every Thursday at the end, every last Thursday of the month. And once we had John as our guest, and John, you were very, very, very critical and pessimistic over the both U.S. and European injection of uh, public money into the economy. Have you changed your opinion or are you still, you know, supporting that idea? And what is that you see coming out of this big amount of money that will be pumped? We don't know exactly when, because apparently is Europe has promised it. Countries somehow have discussed about it. They have implemented legislation for that, but money hasn't arrived yet. So for, for the moment, it's just a promise. What do you see happening in the next weeks? And have you changed your opinion about the incredible amount of money that is pouring here? First of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be among you and participate in this wonderful event. Congratulations to all the participants, because it's a journey that gives us the rewards, not the destination itself. Now, um, let me say that uh, we live in a watershed, watershed moment in human history. Why is, it, why is it a watershed moment? Because we are changing. The globe is changing. The politics is changing. The statecraft is changing. The geopolitical dimensions are changing. Physical and monetary policy is changing. Sociology is changing. The way that we work is changing. And in, if I could use only one word that can describe all those changes is institutionalization. When we have watershed moments in human history, like Second World War or First World War or any war, life changes forever and we never go back. Now, if you look at the European Union, or the United States government, they describe COVID-19 as war. So we don't have war with um, military means. We have a different kind of war. And the way that they have decided to fight this war is by throwing money into the problem. So they threw money into research and development for M RNA and they succeeded. Uh, I think that we are all happy to hear that the private sector, however funded by the government, they discover vaccines in record time. Usually vaccines will take at least five years to be developed. This time it took less than a year. So from that perspective, we are happy. What I'm not happy about is the institutionalization of vices that probably are taking place as we speak. What do I mean? First and foremost, the size of the government increases. And every time we have a bigger government, we have bigger problems. Because the definition of a government is not efficiency, is not lack of waste, is not the absence of corruption. It might be the exact opposite. So the vices that potentially are coming because of wasted money, because of inefficiencies, and maybe because of corruption, will undermine not just the economic activity, but the social fabric. And when you undermine and corrupt the social fabric, the world goes to hell. So I want just to interject the four points that I get from President Washington's farewell address. In his farewell address, he emphasized four points. For a nation, for a country to experience growth, prosperity, and civility, four items need to take place. Item number one, we need to be very careful 
the wars that we fight need to be worthy and just. And if COVID is a worthy cause, then the money that needs to be thrown needs to be justified. Second thing he said is that we need to av avoid to become a tribe. So when we eventually develop a culture of tribes, we fracture the nation, we fracture the country, and the only thing that comes out of fracture is division. The third thing he said is that we need to be realists. And I don't know if there is realism when we increase the deficit of a country by 100% in one year. I don't know how realism, how realistic it is when the Federal Reserve Bank had a balance sheet 13, 14 years ago in 2007 of 700 billion, and now its balance sheet is 700 trillion. Really? The economy has grown 10 times in the last 14 years for the Fed to increase its balance sheet 10 times from 700 billion to 7 trillion? and keeps growing. How about the ACB balance sheet? It has been growing almost 14 times, 1,400% in the last 10 years. How realistic is that? So we need to combine realism with idealism, he said. In, and for, for that idealism cannot take place unless it's point number four, we cultivate a moral character in the people. And moral character in the people cannot be separated and be grown apart from solid education based on classical ideas. So am I still afraid that we are institutionalizing vices by throwing money to problems? Yes, I am. And because the globe is changing, because we are changing with it, within it, I think the only perspective that people who believe in liberty and freedom and democracy is to educate the younger generation with the classical ideas. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much. When you talk about institutionalizing vices, you talk about morality and you talk about education. Let me turn to an educator, actually. That is where I see him is Nikola Ilich. Nikola. You are an educator, instructor, a professor, let me say, but at the end, you are an educator. Um, can we actually educate our people differently after this experience of COVID-19? I know I'm going a bit beyond the scope of, the, of today, but I think John came, you know, concluded with it. We need to educate people to sort of classical uh, conservative values. Um, is that right? Or should we also educate to change in a way? Because we need some change and we need probably to face and to challenge problems in a different way. But before uh, giving the floor to you, uh, let's say that President Biden did something good. You know, I, I know you're smiling now. Uh, he started this CIA investigation over the famous lab in Wuhan and probably was a good time to start thinking about that. That, you know, it's not about conspiration, but it's about finding the truth in order to defend and promote science. It, it's, there is a lack of transparency when people will develop a sentiment against science and against any irrational thinking. And right now I felt very stupid to believe that there was a bat, a bat going around uh, Wuhan uh, 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 biting people and spreading the virus. You know, there's no bat evidence that the virus was coming from a bat in Juan, and there are more evidence it's coming from a lab. So finally, a good action from President uh, Biden. Let's see where this is uh, uh, leading, but let me go now back to our topic to Nicola. Nicola, you're there. Yes, I'm here. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, and thank you for this kind introduction and for yeah. very interesting questions. Uh, in my opinion, other speakers already covered the most relevant issues that are related to the post-pandemic world, and I'll try to contribute a little bit to this uh, discussion by making an additional point. Uh, in essence, I'm an optimist, 
And I think that in the long run, uh, I know it's not intuitive, but in the long run, uh, we could have a lot of benefits and a greater economic growth due to the pandemic. Of course, I will explain. To put it simple, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think that we all agree that this pandemic is the biggest challenge for national economies and for a global financial system ever since it was established, since the Second World War. It's a huge challenge. Uh, but still, I think that while struggling with, uh, with the coronavirus, we got many lessons and we got many innovations and improvements. Uh, observing on a micro level, individual participants in the market learned how to uh, handle the crisis and how to be more efficient, more productive, how to improve their products and services. And in the long run, I think that could contrib contribute to greater economic growth. Of course, the problem that we are facing is, is a strict regulation and, and uh, I would say over-regulation uh, uh, in certain fields. And I hope that governments will realize that they cannot replace the markets, that we have to rely on markets. And I really hope that this will be one of the lessons that we'll have after the pandemic. And in that sense, of course, I agree that we should educate younger people based on classical ideas. And I really uh, uh, still truly believe in markets and I think that's the only solution. But uh, looking from the positive side, I think that we'll have certain improvements in markets due to the challenge that we are facing. And as I said, due to increased efficiency and increased productivity, we, go, we could have greater economic growth in the future. Of course, under the assumption that governments uh, uh, realize how market is important and how the, the functioning of free market is important. Also, one of the biggest lessons that we, we could have from the crisis is that we are all interconnected or intertwined. No one is immune to the coronavirus and uh, there is no single economy that, that, could work, uh, that, that could work alone or could be isolated and function successfully. So we really need to have a global financial system uh, which relies on, on a free national markets. So in essence, I, I'm an optimist and yes, my, my answer is, to you is yes, we should educate younger people and I think that we should use this opportunity to, 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 to say how markets are important and what could be the benefits in the future. Uh, thanks, Nicola, um, for being so concise and, and also using the word optimistic. And actually, that means that you tend to differentiate yourself from John, that apparently was not so optimistic. A little bit, and, yes. And to Suzanne, that apparently herself was not very optimistic. Then, Suzanne, are you defending your pessimism at this point? And do you believe that education can instead divert the direction and turn us into a more optimistic view? But before answering this, there is a question from, and I should tell people that are following us here on Zoom uh, and the many that are following us on Facebook, they, on Facebook, unfortunately, they cannot make questions. They can make, make questions on Facebook, of course, but I'm not reading Facebook because I'm generally not very, very quick and smart with technology, uh, particularly with social media. But there is a question that comes from a person I know, name her is Barbara. Uh, question to Susan is, uh, Susan, you mentioned the importance of family life, which individuals see more important now. Uh, what do you think about the issue of work-life balance and how to keep our productivity up? So there are two questions. One is the one by Barbara, and the second one by me is, do you believe in education to turning your pessimism into optimism? Uh, I'll start with your questions, Pietro. Yes, I do. And I think um, my pessimism is mainly around entrepreneurship, which is my, my, the subject closest to my heart. And um, as I said before, I'm pessimistic that I think that this pandemic time, if I could call it so, has made people question uh, the hard work you put in to be an entrepreneur, to be a successful entrepreneur, which I think is uh, so much hard work that no one 
knows how hard it is if you haven't done it yourself. It's uh, so so I, I think you start questioning the drive you have somewhere. And that's my pessimism. However, I am extremely optimistic and it was a delight to listen to Nicola. Uh, I think it's a brilliant time for uh, educating as hard as we can about the uh, importance of free markets because that's the way out of this in a bit. It's the regulations and red tape that can make everyone depressed and not want to do anything. It's like hitting your head against the hard wall all over again. And can we tone down that one? Can, can we cut red tape? And can we educate the next generation of decision makers to see free market as uh, the, main, the main road to go? Uh, we, we could end in a good place. Absolutely. So I'm, I, I, share, I share that uh, vision. And uh, for going over to Barbara's question, which was how you balance balance uh, work. Well, I sort of forgot it. Sorry. The the, 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 the question, Susanna, is um, since you mentioned family life, and you know people would probably move uh, to the countryside now, having their pool instead of uh, being in a super loft in downtown, whatever, uh, and you know coming back to those so-called classic uh, values. But on the other hand, uh, there is the question, work life, um, how much do they really work once they all sit at home, do working from home, and how does it affect our productivity? And I was just wondering how you, especially as an entrepreneur, view this. Okay. Uh, that's pros and cons with everything. Uh, my productivity as owning a business I, I, I have to I have to be productive otherwise I can just go home basically and uh, but I think it's worked better than I expected to work remotely uh, for the kind of business we do and I've seen family values I've seen those increase the importance of uh, good family values that's what I mean but I don't think it will affect productivity productivity as such however it might affect the balance you might not want to climb in your career because because partly of high taxes for example it doesn't pay off as much so i think we could it's a wrong a wrong expressions to say but the fat and happy symptom uh, even though it's not fat and happy times in uh, in so to speak it it could actually drown uh, productivity a bit so um, yeah something like that thanks thanks suzanne uh, um john i'm coming back to you for last round of, of of talks here uh when we talk about education and you mention it but the question i have is during a pandemic or right now that the pandemic is sort of you know slowing down and somehow uh disappearing hopefully how do you think we can tell people to turn to other values and to another morality and to support the idea, for instance, of a free market, a competition, what Suzanne was just saying, when there is so much money being thrown to us, uh, not literally, I would say, unfortunately, but the money is coming and it's supposed to help the economy. How can you tell people, look, that way is wrong when money is coming, the other way is the right one? Yes. Um, if we go back to the concept of productivity, and I know that indirectly I will answer your question, but then I will address it directly. Productivity, when working from home, let's say, or from a distance, requires discipline. In other words, I have the discipline to be faithful to the entity, to the enterprise, to my boss, and produce quality work from a distance. Discipline requires character. Character requires moral education. So we go back to the root, I believe. And my fear is, actually it's not a fear, it's a reality. Here in the US, people are paid 
extra, extra unemployment benefits to the tune of close to $2,500 a month on top of the unemployment benefits. So they are disincentivized to go and look for work. That goes back to the concept of institutionalizing vices rather than institutionalizing virtues. So from that perspective, when we institutionalize vice, I'm not that optimistic. The optimism comes when we, we establish a plan, maybe starting with small communities, starting with pilot programs, of educating the youngsters, starting from kindergarten and elementary schools. That's where my optimism comes. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now, so you turn from, from being pessimistic into optimism. <laughs> yeah, but I also believe in the second law of thermodynamics, right? That disintegration <laughs> prevails. <laughs> Let me give you, can I give you an example of disintegration? Sure, sure. Okay, you, you mentioned what could the consequences be of this throwing money activity. I think one fear that I have, and as I manage other people's money, as my manage assets, I see an inflationary wave coming in from four sources. One source is the money that the government throws. The second thing is that there is a lot of liquidity around because central banks provide that liquidity. The third source is the savings. Savings in the United States right now are between 16 and 20% per household. US households did not save. So now they are saving because they're not spending. And that savings eventually will be thrown back into the market within the next few months. So there will be higher demand. Then there are constraints, supply constraints. So you have higher demand on one side, supply constraints on the other, and you have an inflationary wave. I know central banks believe it will be temporary. I hope so. I hope I'm wrong, but I think that inflationary or inflationary pressure could be here to stay. And because of inequalities and conflicts, you may have another force um, from the, those conflicts that could push prices higher. Wage pressures are already here in the United States, and I think they're coming also in the European Union. They are indeed. Uh, they are very much, and there, there's a much of concern. Uh, Nicola, uh, sharing your uh, optimism and, and, and turning to education, uh, do you think that what you said earlier about convincing that market is in a way uh, uh, um, the winner, uh, do you think that uh, particularly you stay in Belgrade, uh, the, let's say the, the core of the Europe or close to the border, let's say, or close to the core of the European Union, do you think the European institution would understand this concept and in a way uh, uh, they will leash their uh, um, government influence idea because this is a recovery plan at the end is lasting for very long we're not talking about a one year uh, injection of money we're talking about a seven eight years injection of money that should have consequences in long term so uh, this policy if works will have a long time impact we're not talking about weeks or months we're talking about years probably a decade or even more so during this decade what can we do to convince people, you know, about what John was saying and to go back to the idea of productivity? Because one thing is that we can be happy with a low salary. We can be happy with a sort of universal income and we don't need to work much harder into what Suzanne was saying, investing and producing innovation. This could be the risk. And at the end, we become a sort of uh, Chinese a uh, market where we can buy things for a cheap price. We can be happy with low wages and that's it. And we lose our innovative and entrepreneurial and creative power. Uh, thank you once again for, for a really challenging question. 
Uh, uh, yes, I agree. It's it's a huge problem and it's a huge challenge. Uh, but still, I, I I do believe that there is a place for there is a room for improvement and there 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 is a way out from this situation. And as you mentioned, yes, we we have these policies. But at the end of the day, I think that we have these policies because. They are, they are made in accordance with the preferences of the people living in European Union or uh, it's the same with any other region or country. Uh, so we have to change these preferences uh, of people and a, way, a good way to do that is, is through education, to educate younger people, younger generations and to basically create these preferences uh, to, to explain to these people to understand that more regulation means more inefficiencies and, and less benefits for all of us. And also the education is, is important, but it's not the, the, the only possible solution. I think that we all should work uh, 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 more and, and, and try to contribute in a broader context uh, to, to create some kind of movement, broader movement. And that's why I think events such as such are such as this one and, and uh, organizations such such as Austrian Economic Center are so important because they are able to create that kind of movement and and a broader movement and it's not only about education it's about writing publishing spreading ideas and explanations and that's why I think that these events are important and uh, there I can see our role. Of course, it's it's uh, it, it's a difficult task. It's not a, an easy one, and we have to work a lot to 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 contribute to 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 broader community. But still, I believe that's possible, and still I can see uh, uh, the light uh, at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, Barbara, we are can seven... I can I ask you a question? Yeah, is just, the light at the end of the please. tunnel? Is the light at the end of the tunnel indeed the end of the tunnel, or a train coming? You're asking to me or to Nikolai? Anyone. <laughs> yeah, since, since, as I said, since I'm an optimist, I, I think it's the end of the tunnel. Yeah, but... but Watch for the train. I, I think it's the end of the tunnel. And, and in any event, uh, we should work harder and we should try to, to do that, uh, 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 to, to make that broader movement. Because as you said, the, the, the destination is not a goal but the, the journey. So we are on this journey and no matter whether there is a train or the end of the tunnel, we should do our best. If it's, if it's a train at the end of the tunnel, you want to go backwards, not forward. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want a head-to-head -head collision. That's yeah, true, but, but cannot, John, I, I'm afraid we cannot go backward. Yeah, but in, in, I'm just, in kidding. That, just kidding. Yeah, of course. John, of course. John has lost his uh, Greek spirit. Um, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, when we see a train coming, we just jump on it and take wherever it leads us. <laughs> <laughs> we need to survive. Uh, anyway, thanks, John. Thanks, Suzanne. And thanks, Nicola, for uh, this lively uh, discussion. Uh, and yes, it's true. We, we, Barbara, we made, uh, we have to say that European Resource Bank has been entirely online, has been a very busy month. There will be more events coming in the future. But as you said, at the, I think we were still offline. It's been very stressing and it's been, you know, uh, tough to be, to host so many events because we wanted to do them, but at the end online. So on one side, there was this wheel and this, courage and braveness to get together and to discuss but on the other side it has been uh, uh, very tough and the fact that we cannot meet each other was kind of pushing us to do more things but at the same time we felt something is missing at, at the end as we said in the Rome uh, resource bank that we uh, hosted last week we are you know social animals and we need to get together and we need to sit next to each other and even agree or disagree and uh, we did an incredible job, Barbara. You did, uh, you and Victoria and Brit and the people in Vienna did an incredible work. Uh, but at the very end, we should get together. That's the, the that's the end of the story. Uh, uh, not just to discuss, but also you know to eat and to and to have a good time uh, uh, together. That's the uh, you know human nature. And uh, Barbara, I want to give the the the, the word uh, back to you for the final remarks of this incredible journey 
incredible journey with these guys. I would say these kids, because most of them are very young, that are uh, 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 into, in taking this incredible adventure of new projects. And I think, think it's thanks to them that uh, uh, you know we will evolve and we'll probably solve some of these problems. We can still make the difference, but as a famous French movie was saying, the word is to you. And in this case, the you is the young people. And I think our role is to help them building the framework in which they can develop their own dreams and their own uh, projects. So let me pass the, uh, uh, um, the word and the floor back to you, Barbara, for final remarks. And I want again to thank Suzanne, John and Nikolai and all these kids that were here with us, the ones that are following us on Zoom and the ones that are following us on Facebook, but we're coming back with more events Austrian economics, Compedra, and all the family here on Zoom. But very soon, Barbara, I'll make a promise, we will meet somewhere soon indeed. after the pandemic. <laughs> in, indeed, Pietro, very much. Uh, that's very true. And I will give you a couple of ideas of what we will see uh, next year at the European Resource Banking meeting, just to make you curious and that you, that you give you a, the hunger for you know, joining the event and also for participating and being part of, of, of the group of this uh, tremendous, wonderful free market uh, group in Europe that, that was built over the last 25 years and that we see grow every year. And uh, not only thanks to our sponsors and partners who make this possible and who I de definitely want to thank, whether it's the Kribel Foundation, whether it's Gro Global Philanthropic Trust, uh, the Taxpayers Association of Europe, World Taxpayers Association, IES, uh, the European Economic Senate, the Free Choice Institute, uh, the Austrian Economic Center, Competere, Hayek Institute, uh, all those groups that have been part have been supporting financially and intellectually and uh, have been who we have been ha, who we have the privilege of working with over the past uh, decade or so and uh, just to give you more ideas of where what will happen next year in Rome Pietro and team and and our team and our team were discussing which wine winery we should go for the big celebration of Dragon's Den event for example whether we will go to south of Rome or whether we will go north of Rome or whether we just skip that and just go to the famous market in Rome. Um, we will probably hopefully be able to host the event at a very historic site uh, in Rome. So there will be plenty of opportunity, plenty of choice for you to make it interesting and um, uh, fruitful, uh, not only food for thought, but also for uh, for your stomach. I mean, everybody, I think of us loves Italy and enjoys it. So we hope that Italy is as beautiful after the pandemic as it was before, and the hospitality is as great as it was before. And let me just conclude by also thanking once again our participants today, Yaron, Susanne, uh, John, and Nicola for, uh, for for the discussion and for your um, uh, contributions. Pietro, it's always fun to work with you and to have you as a moderator. Um, and uh, lastly, once again, congratulations to our winners. Make sure that you will report on how you succeed, how you improve uh, your status, how things get along, how many media uh, uh, attentions you have, how, ch how much change you brought about, because this is actually what matters. And after all, it's about individual freedom and entrepreneurial freedom. And this is what needs to be defended. Thanks. Thank you all. Looking Barbara, forward. sorry, just to interrupt you. You sound very much with, like the president of the commission. You need to report. You need to be accountable. Guys, let's be a bit Italian. Spend the money as you want. You don't need to hey, come on. Back. We're not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing this way. You know, we are accountable to our donors and partners. Uh, just spend money. That's for sure. <laughs> After all, we spent other people's money and it's, you know, we are, we are taxpayers, you know, we should ask our politicians what they do with our money. So we're used to that. So now we have the privilege of spending private money uh, of our donors. And that's exactly uh, where we need to be uh, careful and where we hold everybody accountable uh, for who is doing that. So just uh, to make sure, lastly,
we don't do it in a, this. We don't do it in an Italian way. We do it uh, up front. You see, Lilia <laughs> still believes in the, there is no free lunch. There is uh, yes, always exactly. a free lunch. Somebody else is paying for you. Huh? There's yeah, always a free are, lunch. Uh, this is what the Italians <laughs> think. <laughs> Uh, but not, but not the Austrians. You know, Austrian economists believe in responsibility. And having said that, I'm going to close the session now. Thank you all for joining, believing in in true values, in responsibility, and individual freedom. Uh, looking forward to seeing you soon at our next events, the Free Market Roadshow. Uh, we'll uh, we'll continue next Tuesday. Uh, and events to follow, and of course, uh, our event with Pietro and Competere, our monthly Austrian economic, economics conference, and the many conferences that uh, also Michael Yeager is putting up on the European Economic Senate, where we cooperate. Thank you all for joining. Looking forward to seeing you. Stay healthy, well, and wise. Bye. <laughs>